ended our last video with a film clip that showed the obstacle a street uh, car motorman had to uh, go through, uh, things that were cutting in front of him and so forth. And uh, it was dangerous, uh, but not so much really for the streetcar driver. It was dangerous for the pedestrians. It was dangerous for the people that were cutting back and forth. And accidents with the trolley car was uh, much more common than you would think. Uh, people falling off the car, or people getting hit with the car, uh, and uh, carriages being hit by the car. There's one really good example of this that I wasn't even aware of that involved our president, Theodore Roosevelt. He was almost killed in a collision with the trolley car. This is what the newspaper article said. President Roosevelt's recent New England trip was marred by a very sad accident on the morning of September 3rd, while the president's party was en route from Pittsburgh, Massachusetts, to the country club at Lenox. As a result of the collision with the trolley car, one of the president's attendants, William Craig, of the Secret Service was killed outright. Mr. Roosevelt and the Secretary of State were badly shaken up, while the driver of their carriage, David Pratt, was so severely hurt that, uh, that for some time his life was despaired of, but he is in convalescing. In the carriage with President Roosevelt, and that aside was the governor of Massachusetts, fortunately, he also escaped practically unhurt. Mr. Roosevelt and the governor were thrown to the right while Craig fell directly in front of the car and was terribly mangled by the wheels. The Secretary of State was thrown backwards and suffered a concussion to the back of his head. The driver was rendered unconscious, and one of the horses was so badly injured that it had to be shot. Three of the carriage wheels were smashed. The only thing that saved the President and the Governor was their being thrown to the right instead of the left. After the accident, the trolley cars were no able longer to be on the road while the President was en route. First thing that came to my mind is that this must have been before the uh, law that said that the trolleys had to have cow catchers on the front of them or a guard so people wouldn't fall under the wheels. And as the automobile came into vogue, uh, this was becoming a major problem because everyone thought they could drive pretty much wherever they wanted to. So uh, the following video is a film clip uh, for a film that was put out for, so that people would understand how to how to operate safely on the streets, how to be safe as a passenger on a streetcar, and, and how to be safe while driving uh, among the streetcars. All right, watch out, buddy. Whoa, did you feel that breeze? A little close for comfort. Well, I'm in a hurry. I guess I'll just pull out here. I don't think there's anything. Whoops. Oh, look at that conductor come out. He's going to pull the door up and pull me out of there. Watch out. Ooh, that had to hurt. Oh, you all right? You all right? Yeah, just my legs broken. I'll be fine. This is how we're supposed to be careful. Look both ways. All right, we're good to go. This is how we're going to be cautious. Look both ways. Okay, we'll get this conductor out here, make sure there's not a train coming. If there was, he's in trouble. Okay, you can come ahead now. Good deal. This guy is moving way too slow. Maybe I'll just tap him a little bit. Oh, well, maybe I shouldn't have tapped him. Oh, he looks a little upset. Uh, look at the bumper here. Oh, shoot. I missed him. I don't think I should have had the last drink. Ah, uh, see if I can miss this streetcar. Oh, I missed the streetcar. But I didn't miss the car. Whoops. What do you mean you smell alcohol in me? That's vapor rub. Ah, uh, it's no problem. It'll, it'll run just fine. Here comes Grandma. Oh, do da do da day. Yep. Come on, a little bit further. Yep. Good, good girl. Look at this idiot coming on my road. Oh, he sideswiped us. Oh no! Let's go check it out. Look at that. 
I can see the dent. Did you get his license number? No, I didn't. Okay, I think I can make it across. No, I can't! I better turn. Uh-oh, i got to pass this streetcar. I'm going to be late for work. i got to pass this streetcar. I think I can make it. I think I can make it. Nah, I got it made. Now nah, I'm going to go right... Oh, between the two trees. Oh! I always wanted a compact car. Look at that. What do you think? We just take it to the body shop. See what we can do. You want to drive it? You want to tow it out of here? You want to tow it out? All right, let's go. This next little portion doesn't really have anything to do with the streetcar, but I thought you might enjoy it. You can see what the kids used to do before there was video games. Just had a lot of fun outdoors. Here comes this fellow up. Doing a pretty good job of navigating that wagon and now he's got a little help. Kid on the roller skates is pulling him. Ooh, everybody got on that truck. That boy's getting dragged along. Here's the fellow with the roller skates looking quite innocent just sitting there. The fellow gets in the car, he hangs on the bumper and away he goes. What fun. Well, I digressed a little bit here, but uh, today we want to look at a streetcar that's not really called a streetcar. It's called an inner urban car. Inner urban cars were electric streetcars that ran long distance routes. Like the streetcars, they were classified as street railways in which light gauge tracks carried metal wheeled carriages powered by overhead electric lines. While streetcars generally ran on lines embedded in the city streets, Interurbans used private right-of-ways in the open expanses outside the city limits. They offered an alternative to the more expensive and more rigidly scheduled steam lines and had the advantage of street access in the city. Unlike the city street rails, the interurbans had no horse-drawn predecessor. Distances covered by the interurbans were economically feasible only with electric traction. And while the interurban routes averaged less than 60 miles, the system was so widespread by 1919 that it was possible, uh, theoretically anyway, to go to Toledo and Cleveland and from those places connect all the way to Port Huron. In this photograph here, you can see one of the interurban cars coming across uh, from the Military Street Bridge. And you can see the difference between that and a regular street car from this insert. The interurban car was more luxurious than their city cousins. The interurban served the most prosperous clientele that could afford suburban life. Sporting a steel frame and heavier suspension, the car seen here was a state-of-the-art in light rail technology, of course a term that was not used back then, yet it carried a wood-burning stove in case the car lost power on an open country run in the wintertime. This photograph was taken uh, just south of the Military Street Bridge. You can see it in the background and to the right is the bank that was there before the Michigan National Bank and of course Bank America now. The interurbans had several advantages over the steam railroads. Because the electric uh, interurban trolleys were very economical to operate, they could carry passengers between the same cities as the steam railroads, but for less money. So the fares on the interurbans in most cases were cheaper than the steam railroads. Plus the ability of the interurban lines to operate their trains more economically allowed them to provide more frequent service than the steam railroads. And because the interurban trolleys had powerful electric motors and were able to accelerate to top speed much more rapidly than a steam locomotive, they were able to maintain faster schedules than the steam railroads could between two cities. Even though the interurban trolleys quite often made more frequent stops in rural areas than the steam railroads did. The interurbans could still maintain a faster schedule because of their ability to accelerate more rapidly. Also because interurban trolleys could make more frequent stops, they became popular with farmers and other people who lived in rural areas. I mean, look at this road here. It makes you wonder how the tracks could even be stabilized on this kind of a road, but these interurban cars went out there and took care of the farmer. 
the ability to stop at these rural crossings for passengers and then accelerate back to top speed quickly allowed the interurban lines to serve a market that was impossible for the steam railroads to serve economically. This gave the farmer the opportunity to move his produce to, to market in the larger cities that weren't even that close to him. Another advantage is the interurban entered many of the cities and towns along their lines directly over the rails of the local trolley line in each city or town. This allowed the interurbans to bring passengers directly to the downtown business district of the cities and towns they served. In many cases, the steam railroad depots were a few blocks outside the downtown business district. This required passengers of the steam railroads to either walk downtown or hire a livery to take them downtown. This photograph here shows an interurban car going over the Military Street Bridge. And this one here is by the old courthouse, and that's an inter, uh, interurban car that we're looking at uh, as well on Broad Street. So by using the local uh, rails, they were pretty much able to take the passengers wherever they wanted to go in the downtown area. And here's an interurban car going south on Military Street uh, near the old Maxine Theater. Where would the streetcar and the interurban cars be without the conductor and the motorman? Uh, that was the heart of the organization, really. That's what made everything go. The motorman was basically the driver of the streetcar, and that was his only responsibility other than the maintenance of the car. The conductor, on the other hand, had to look out for the welfare of the passengers, and they also had to collect the money uh, as they entered the car and made sure the passenger was comfortable and didn't fall off the streetcar. These fellows here looked pretty snazzy in their uniforms. Actually, these uniforms were uh, requested by the government, according to this article right here. New type uniform will be worn by motormen of interurban lines as a result of government requests. In accordance with government requests, motormen of our interurban line cars will hereafter wear a new type of uniform. It will consist of coat and trousers made of blue and a white pin check overall cloth, with the coat cut extra long and having four outside pockets, one lower left, one lower right, one upper left with separate compartments for watch and pencil, and one upper right. Detachable silver buttons will be furnished by the company. So it almost seems like they would have to furnish their own uniforms. Here are the interurban buttons that they were referring to. I'm sure they weren't real silver, but they're a silver color anyway. Uh, most of the local lines used a brass button, so maybe that was to distinguish them. The smaller buttons would have been for the vest, and the larger buttons would have been for their outside coat. Streetcar companies were always looking for conductors or motormen to work on their uh, streetcars. And, of course, uh, during the war years, it was very difficult because all the men were in service. And so they started advertising not only for men, but also for women. Men on the streetcar lines didn't appreciate having women uh, on their streetcars and did everything they could to discourage them and harass them. And uh, a couple cases, even throwing them off the cars. And so this article came out. You can read this article at your leisure about basically what it says that uh, men are just a bunch of male chauvinist pigs and that women should be allowed to work on the streetcars. This appears to be a group of uh, conductors, or in the women's case, who are called conductress, um, and it looks like maybe a graduating class from uh, the streetcar school, whatever they were teaching them at the time. Mainly how to get along with the men, I suppose. And this conductress looks like she's getting along with the conductor all right. Maybe she's still on the car. Of course, the main job of the conductor was to collect the money from the patrons that uh, entered the streetcar. And uh, earlier, they did it this way. They kept uh, a coin uh, register or coin uh, container. Uh, this fellow looks like he's wearing it around his neck. I've never seen one of these, but when I was researching this, I came up with this, and this could be something quite similar. This was the Omer Fair Register, and uh, it was supposed to keep track of not only the money, but also uh, the fares as they boarded. Of course, it was still uh, operated by the conductor. And at some point, they had these coin uh, changers here that you see around this fellow's neck. 
And this is the one that most of us are familiar with. When I was growing up, all the gas station attendants had them on their belts to make change for the customer. The problem with these uh, two different types of coin changers was that the uh, operator could pretty much have his own system. And too many of them had the system where it's one for you and one for me, and one for you and two for me. And so the company was quite concerned with this, and they eventually went to this system here. This is the box that changed everything. But the more scheming conductors uh, figured a way around this. They would put their hand out to the customer when they entered the streetcar, and the customer would put the money in their hand, and they would make the change and drop it into the uh, container there, the drop box. Of course, the company called onto this, and they start posting these signs, saying, don't let the conductor put your fare in the box. Do it yourself. And it went on to reiterate uh, why they were doing that. Of course, they say it was good for the customer, but it was mainly good for the company. The extra benefit to the company is the fact that, well, we don't really need a conductor anymore. The motorman can take the money right where he's sitting down as they come in and we don't need the conductor, so we'll save money, and that's what they did. They went to the one-man car. So that put a lot of people out of work. Many of the larger cars in the larger cities still had the two people, the conductor and the motorman, and uh, of course many of the, the larger inner urban cars had two people as well. In our next video, we'll look at the inner urban system that most Port Huron folks use, and that was the rapid railway. And most folks just went from Detroit to Port Huron, or they went up along uh, the river and lake to visit relatives and so forth. And we'll, uh, we'll look more into the, uh, the route of the Rapid Railway. We'll look at some of the stops. We'll look at the cars in detail, see the insides of them. And maybe we'll find out a couple of things we didn't know.